different forms of yoga around. There are many types of yoga that you might have heard of. The traditional practice of yoga we, that we follow is Ashtang yoga. So I request the media person to move it to the next uh, slide. So Ashtang yoga, it's basically uh, not a ladder system, but more of a uh, flower. It's petals, parts of a flower where all the petals are as important as the other. And it's a holistic practice. So yoga is determined, uh, determined as um, this practice is known as Ashtang yoga, the eight limbs. So these are disciplines, disciplines uh, of, the, of the yama, niyama, which is social conduct for personal and environmental um, being. We have the practices of asanas, which are many times people have understood as postures, but more than that, they exist is in pranayam, pratahara, dharana, dhyana, samadhi. So all these eight limbs are all interconnected. And for us to evolve, we need to connect to all of these. But sometimes we need to slowly start building on the maybe the external uh, or the more uh, outward practices of yoga and then move on well inwards. So we'll just move on to the next slide and to see how these Ashtang yoga practices can be used. So yoga for mental health. So um, if you've noticed, when anybody has a mental issue, they say, um, the first thing they will say is the word, I'm stressed. Stress is a very important word, okay? And stress is a risk factor in all the mental disorders. So it could be a variety. It could be mood swings. It could be unipolar, more, uh, bipolar um, feelings or emotions. Uh, many often you hear anxiety, uh, depression that we also had heard yesterday, last week from our uh, resource person. There are other sleeping, uh, there are other disorders that we tend to overlook, like sleeping disorders, eating disorders, and um, OCD, obsessive uh, compulsive disorders, and many more. All of this uh, bring about changes in the mind. So how does yoga help? Well, all yoga components, all of these components, allow and reduce stress effectively, helping in elevating all mental disorders. So we are not just connecting to one, but all of them. So we'll move ahead to see how it really works. What is the mechanism of how yoga works on the mind? So let's understand the mechanism. Moving ahead towards the next slide. Okay. So there are two approaches uh, that generally work in the practices of yoga. So the first approach that if you see, it's the top to down. So basically from the mind to the body, it is known in the scientific term as neurocognitive approach. So the practices of yoga may increase your emotional regulation and subsequently influence brain and nervous system activities. So I'm gonna request you all just for a moment. Uh, how, what does that mean? Just you can type it in. When you are stressed, when you are uh, disturbed, okay? uh what is happening uh, generally what happens to you do you become you could you can just type in a few words if you don't mind what happens when you are stressed just anybody can just type in one or two words when you are stressed when you have a little bit mental disorders or uh, not disorders mental activity hyper uh, mental activity what happens to you I look forward to seeing the chat okay staying alone you feel like staying alone not in the mood to do anything correct very good Pimples, yes, it's hormonal changes that take place. Heartbeat, yes, it's your, your all cardiac activity picks up. So all of this is happening. So when we're doing the yoga practices, thank you so much for this one, frustration. I, very good, mild headache, uh, beautiful response. So this is, the fact that you're aware of this is happening is wonderful. Many a times we ignore, we suppress this, we don't know what, and then suddenly it comes out in spurts. So being aware is also very wonderful, worried. So let's understand back to where practices of yoga increases emotional regulation. So when we're doing yoga practices, you will be mostly told to, uh, which it was for the practice of asana or anything, notice the way you are um, breathing, the sensations that are happening around you. Can we go back to the previous two slides? Yeah, this one, before that, okay. So what you're doing, the minute you start being aware of what you're sensing, what you're breathing, Ma'am, you're on mute. Okay, I'm sorry, it's not on how that happened. Okay, am I audible now? Am I good? Can I get a thumbs up for? Yes, ma'am. 
All right, thank you. I'm sorry. I did not know how that happened. So if you were just uh, going back to the top bottom uh, approach. So what is happening is that the minute we're doing yoga practices, we are focusing on what we are sensing and the way that we are breathing. The minute we do that, all other matters take a back seat. So all these stresses and strains take a back seat. And this is how yoga helps from the top down because first we start working on the emotions the emotions become in somewhat control and the emotions start to work on the brain and the nervous system so you have much more control the second approach that yoga uh, uh, offers or it works uh, in within us is the bottom up approach and that is called the neuro psychological approach so what does that mean so basically we're connecting to the vagal tone vagal tone vagal is a Vagal is a nerve, is a cranial nerve, which is connected to the parasympathetic nervous activity. So your parasympathetic nervous activity, in very simple terms, is your rest and digest. So if you're in a calm, rested, digestive way, you can handle things, you can control things, and it automatically deactivates your sympathetic nervous system, which is your fight and flight. Yes, we do need fight and flight, but not all the while. We don't have to be on edge all the while. There's a reason, there's a time that we need to be there. So generally, we try, should try to be in the parasympathetic nervous way. So yoga works in that, in that way. And something else that it works on is the activity or the hypothalamic pituitary axis. So basically, that is your adrenaline uh, flow. So your adrenaline uh, glands work on a stress hormone, which is known as cortisol. So if this cortisol level goes high, high in the body, we are more stressed. So if you can allow the body to uh, do uh, practices of yoga, the components of practice of yoga, if you can reduce this, uh, um, act, uh, this sympathetic system and activate the parasympathetic system, we will be much more in control. So we'll go to the next slide and to see uh, what are the more, some of the components of uh, yoga. As I said, this is just a few components we'll be able to connect to because of the time that we have it available with us. But the component why I've taken is asana because this is one of the most uh, commonly uh, seen um, components of yoga that uh, many are familiar with. So yoga restores the lost balance of the body system due to the mental problem because when we are um, having mental problems, the homeostasis, the balance is lost. So the first thing asana does is brings that harmony back into the system. So uh, a stress affects the muscle tone as we talked about earlier because um, we are tense our muscles become uh, rigid and so the various asanas helps us restore this muscle tone relieving the tension so as you notice very often when you go for an exam your butterfly your tummy gets butterflies or you want to use the loo because the muscles are playing up so if you are doing regular practices this control over these uh, muscles would be more in, uh, in check with you. You could connect it to them easily. The other factor that you, you would mostly uh, observe is during stress, the breathing gets affected. Uh, when you're stressed, your breathing becomes happy, uh, rapid. So these asana practices also help in breathing as well as pranayama practices because they allow the structure where the breathing apparatus exists to work productively. And we connect to the abdominal breathing, which is a wonderful, very important uh, breathing technique that we should be always connecting to, abdominal breathing, normal breathing. Asana practice also involves body awareness, control movements, and breathing awareness. So these are just some of the uh, benefits, uh, the way asana, component of asana works on our mental health. So we'll move ahead to the next slide. All right. Um, Static asanas. Well, they train the neuromuscular system to relax and increase neuromuscular coordination and balance. So many often, uh, you might, today also the session that we'll be having, we will be connecting to static asanas, but we'll also be connecting to a little bit of uh, dynamic asanas, which we will talk about when we're doing the practical session. But the key factor here is that the static asanas, they increase our ne neuromuscular nerve and muscle coordination and balance. And of course, as everybody says, when I do my yoga practices or any type of workout, you, yeah, you feel sense of happiness because they secrete happy hormones. Some of the words that you might have heard of uh, serotonin, um, endorphins, and uh, a few more. So we'll move ahead to the next slide. Okay, the second component here that, that we are gonna be connecting to is pranayam. 
So the key of this practice is pranayama is the, our vital energy or the vital force. So when it gets into the body, we get a lot more energy. So the, the way the pranayama actually works is that when we are learning to connect to the breath, we are first of all learning to expand our lungs and promote abdominal breathing. If you notice when we were born, we were never, nobody taught us to breathe. We were automatically breathing. We were children, if you notice in the sleeping, the abdomen is rising and falling as they breathe. But over the periods of years and uh, the, the type of lifestyle that we live, the mismanagement of our lifestyle, this has slowly moved away and we have uh, learned the incorrect way of breathing. And uh, pranayama practices uh, bring us back to connecting to the, uh, the positive or the correct way of breathing, which influences correct mental thinking also. So now breathing with awareness also allows the brain to get rid of thoughts and emotions. Um, as again, when we talked about breathing, when you think uh, about the breath, when you connect to the breath, the other thoughts become taken back because when we are consciously breathing, we're using the cortex, which is where your thinking mind is. So when we get something else for the mind to do, the other thoughts take a back seat. Okay, we'll move, away, uh, move ahead to the next slide. All right, so here, if you can see the pictures, there's just some examples of breathing practices that you might have seen or heard about. Um, first thing what we're going to today also we're going to be connecting to is uh, learning to learn a deep breathing or abdominal breathing. Some other practices are Brahmari, Ujjayi, Shitali, Shitkari, the alternative nostril breathing. And all of these practices, all the pranayama practices, all connect us to the parasympathetic nervous system. Again, I bring you back to the same base, the rest and digest calming uh, biological system that we need to connect to very often for keeping a stable mind. Pranayam also stimulates secretion of endorphin, which is a natural painkiller, promoting positive state of uh, being. If you've noticed many people uh, go for a jog sometimes, don't even do this kind of exercise, they suddenly see, start feeling good also, which is also very wonderful because endorphins, um, uh, the runner's high. If you suddenly start feeling good, you go for a walk or you go for a jog, that's the runner's high. So in pranayam also, we uh, are uh, getting to secrete this and you feel, start feeling good. We'll move to the next slide. Thank you. As I've said, this is just a little, a brief understanding, just a little touch of what and how yoga works on the mind as well as the body. So we'll come to the next slide. All right, the other yoga techniques. Uh, very often, if you've noticed many, many individuals and rightly so, that uh, people really enjoy the practice of Shavasana. Although at the beginning, you might really love it, and it is right, we should like it. But later on, if you notice, people start to skip it, which is not actually correct. So what does relaxation, relaxation do? Basically, it is a mind-body relaxation. The minute the body relaxes, that relaxation spreads to the mind. So when we are physically relaxed, it slowly travels to the mind, and it relaxes our vagus activity, the, nervous, the vagus nerve, and... Um, some other uh, the relaxations that you might have heard over uh, are shavasan and yoga nidra. Yoga nidra is a little bit more deeper relaxation where uh, we are visualizing and it almost becomes a meditation. Um, uh, it's a combination of both. So it's a very deep relaxation. We'll move ahead to the next slide. Okay. So the next slide is meditation, or we like to call it dhyana because it, the, the sound of this beautiful term is so relaxing in, in itself. So what is happening in meditation? The process of calming of the mind is taking place. So if you've noticed, a peaceful mind resolves conflict. So if you're agitated and irritated, can we allow the mind to resolve anything? Not, not easily possible, not possible to many, of, to many of us. So if we start to inculcate meditation in our daily routine, our mind will be more peaceful, more calm, and we will be able to uh, resolve things, we'll get insights, we'll be, uh, we'll be able to understand the different perspectives of individuals. And some of the meditation techniques are, uh, that you might have heard of is Om Chanting, mindfulness. Today we'll be connecting to mindfulness itself. 
soham chanting and kundalini meditation so basically what is happening in uh, meditation what is the mechanism basically it is changing in neural activity and uh, over a period of time this is happens the neuroplasticity changes in different parts of the brain and this brings changes in the central nervous system so this is especially uh, uh, it also takes places in changes in the emotions and attention regulation so if you've been doing it over a period of time you will be able to connect and understand how to control your emotions and attentions and uh, help yourself and help others also to be more um, controlled and non reactive when my time requires we'll move to the next slide okay and this is basically just a little information about me but uh, there is a reason why I have put this lotus at the end. Let me um, just take a note of that little lotus because we'll be talking about it at the end in the question answers, if possible, if there's time permits. So from here, I will request uh, the media person to kindly stop sharing the screen. So then we can connect to the second part of our wonderful uh, webinar, which is a practical session. So uh, I will need to adjust my uh, viewing so that we can get a better, bigger view of the mats. So I'm going to request everyone to find themselves either sitting on the mat. And if you feel that uh, you are not able to sit on the mat for whatever reason, you may also sit on the chair and connect to the practices. Just give me another moment. Okay, so I'm going to take it a little back. Okay. So we're going to be sitting. But before we start the practical session, a little uh, few guidelines of practical sessions. So I hope uh, many of you will be joining us on the mat. And but again, the few guidelines that we should always keep in mind when we're doing yoga practices, uh, even breathing practices, all yoga practices, if you can do with them on a light stomach, if you've had a heavy meal, we should be waiting for three hours to four hours, but a minimum of two and a half, three hours would be required. Um, we are going to be doing the practices according to our capacity uh, so please don't overdo anything uh, and there's no competition i'm going to request my friend i've introduced my dear friend uh, and my colleague miss vijaya Bhatia. she i have requested her to connect to uh, the modifications in the same practices that we will be doing so the modifications will allow uh, individuals to see how we can support ourselves to move ahead with these practices so we're going to be uh, connecting to the movements now how are we going to do the movements? We are going to be conscious of the movements. Um, the first part, as I said, will be slightly dy uh, dynamic, but even with dynamicity, we are going to be controlling and uh, having under understanding how the body is moving ahead. And uh, we're also going to be connecting to the breath. We're going to, for our regular today's practice, we're going to breathe generally, normally. So I don't want you to hold the breath. I don't want you to feel that you have to hold the breath when you're holding the posture. Keep breathing, keep breathing naturally, normally, and comfortably. So these are a few of the practices and I hope, I hope everybody's worn something comfy so that we can start our practices. So I'm gonna go a little behind, which I'm gonna request you to also go a little more behind so that we are both in the screen. All right. Yeah. So the first practice that we're gonna be connecting to is uh, centering and we're gonna be starting with three Om cars. So please come into a comfortable cross leg position. It can be Sukhasan, it can be um, Padmasana or just a simple cross link. We're going to place the hands on the knees and we're going to allow the use of a mudra. Mudra activates the mind more. So place your thumb and index finger to a gentle touch. Allow the other three fingers slightly straight and just allow yourself to let the eyelids close. So don't force your eyelids to close, just allow the eyelids to gently come to closure. From here, take your attention to your spine. See if there's length in your spine, allow yourself to sit gently tall. Let the shoulders be relaxed, relax your face. And here we're gonna take a few deep breaths and start with the OM. So breathe in and breathe out, preparing for the chant, breathe in. Um. 
नहीं बस हो गया तो आ जाते समझ गया ना मिल जाते Request you to gently rub your palms together and place them over the eyes and the shoulders. So the first practice that we're going to do is a little bit of a warm up and also a little dynamic practice. And why are we connected to the dynamic practice? Is because generally when we are in a state of anxiety or stress, our mind cannot go to the breath so easily, and we can't become stable. The body doesn't let us become stable. So we utilize dynamic practices to take our mind to the movements. and these movements keep the mind engaged and over a certain period of time your mind starts resolve uh, moving away from those thoughts those negative thoughts coming into the positive thought because this practice that we're going to be doing is two simple rounds of surya namaskar and when you do the dynamic movements of surya namaskar there will be a rise in your positive hormones the happy hormones which will bring a sense of well being within you so we're going to be doing surya namaskar just as a point of contraindication if you have a uh, acute back pain or cervical pain kindly do not do this practice with us for now just do watch and learn or if you've had a surgery in the last 6 months uh try it please uh, avoid doing this practice otherwise we are going to just slightly move the mat so that we can see a front view and a side view so hopefully i can be seen clearly all right all right so i hope everybody's with us So just a little note. I just think this. I think not good. No. I think when I have to move it back up, please forgive me for this change of position once again. But wanting to connect to everybody to see every all the practices. So as you can see, both of us, we are standing in the front part of the mat. So uh, prana, uh, Surya Namaskar basically uh, is uh, the traditional Surya Namaskar is made up of twelve. uh our practices practices of asanas which are interlaced beautifully with the breathing but today we're not going to too much focus on the breathing in hill excel just breathe normally and what these practices are they are uh working on the symmetry and asymmetry of uh, body portion so we'll be working towards the same practice and we're going to go according to our comfort as i said i'm going to request vijay because we're doing the modification those individuals who have even a slight knee issue will be taking the towel so uh, i request vijay to please keep a towel for your knees if possible if you don't mind so that uh, we can keep that in mind for those individuals who might have a little also that uh, issue with the knee so from here we're going to keep the feet comfortably close about 2 to 2 inches apart if you wish otherwise you can even keep them together now standing tall in our body we're going to take the first movement inhale we're going to Bring our hand to Namaskar. One. Now it's two. Raise your hands up and gently arch back. Three. We're folding forward, and we're going to take the hand to feet posture. Four. We're going to place the palms on the ground and take the right knee at the back, and right foot at the back, and we're into the runner's pose. Look up with your head. Five, both legs at the back. We're moving into the plank. Look a foot ahead, ahead of you. Six, gently place your knees down and place your chin and chest on the earth into Shastang Asan. The eight limbs on the ground. Seven, we're going to slither up in front into the cobra. Feet comfortably close to each other. Look up. Eight, we're tucking our toes in and we're going to come into downward dog. So just allow yourself to lengthen. There will be a little tightening at the beginning, but that's okay. Allow the hamstrings to lengthen. Nine. Right leg comes back between the two palms. Left knee on the earth. Look up. Ten. Both the feet in front. Hand to feet posture. Eleven. Hands rise into Uddhva Hastasan. Hands and gentle arch back. And twelve. Back at your heart center in Namaskar. So this was the first round which we did. We're going to go slightly faster as per your capacity. Take your own time, but utilize your awareness with the counts. So we're ready. We're taking it from the left side now. So inhale, 
Namaskar, one. Two, hands up, tilt back. Three, hand to feet posture. Four, left leg back, left knee on the earth, look up and run as pose. Five, right leg joins the left leg into plank. Six, Shashtang Asan. Seven, Cobra. Eight, Downward Dog, the other Mokshwanasan. Nine, left leg comes back in front, right knee on the earth. Ten, hand to feet posture. Eleven, we're going to arch back. And twelve, back to Namaskar. Okay. So from here, what we're going to do is that we're going to be doing these practices uh, for about four, depending how your body can take it. Remember, there's no competition. You can take four to five uh, rounds uh, at the beginning, then you can slowly build it up. And if you know that if you do these practices, you will automatically start feeling the anxiety go down because your mind is engaged with the movements and slowly that you can build ahead. So from these dynamic movements, then we can go ahead to the static movements. So we're gonna be now connecting to some practices in a static way. So one of the very beautiful practices, one of, one, one of my favorites is the practice of Parvat because it really allows the mind to stabilize. So once again, we're gonna be taking our legs in front and we're gonna come into a cross leg position. So allow the legs to cross over and sit in a cross leg position. I'm gonna permit that. So I hope everybody is uh, getting to understand how the practices are working on the mind. Not only are you listening to me, but you're also listening to yourself. See how you feel when you're doing these practices. So for Parvatasan, what we're going to do, we're going to take our hands into Namaskar first at the heart center. And again, we're going to connect to another mudra. We're going to connect to the Kali mudra. So the Kali mudra is with a pointer, finger looks up, and your other three fingers interlace, and your thumb also interlaces at the back. Kali Mudra is a detoxifying practice. It finds length and it quietens the mind also. It detox detoxifies the mind also. So with the inhale, ring, bring this Mudra back, not back, bring it up to the head. And then slowly take it up all the way up to the ceiling. Here I want you to allow your eyelids to close and I want you to be here for the next two deep breaths, two to three deep breaths. Breathe in and breathe out. And notice what's happening within your body, what's happening to your spine, what's happening to your rib cage. Find the expansion. And also know what is happening in the mind, what is the state of the mind. And from here, we're gonna slowly bring the hands back to the seat of the heart. And we're going to release the mudra and come back on the arms. So notice how the components of yoga are working. There's the mind on the body and the body on the mind. Understand what is taking place within you, how you feel this moment. From here, we're going to go for a lateral movement. So keeping your legs where they, where they are, we're going to place the hands by the side. Okay. We're taking our right hand to the level of the shoulder. We're going to turn the palm over and then we're slowly taking it up towards the ear. Now we're going to breathe in, inhale and lengthen the right arm. And as we exhale, we're sliding down towards the left. You can just bring a little gentle bend in the elbow and in this position I turn your head to look up at your right bicep turn your head very gently like you're turning a key in a lock and notice what is happening inside the chest region expansion of the rib cage the intercostal muscles working find the deeper breath taking place 
slowly coming back in the center. Bring the hand back to the level of the shoulder. Turn the palm over, slowly return. We're gonna take the left side. So let's lift the left hand up. Turn the palm over. Bring it by the side of the ear. Lengthen. And then slowly we're sliding down the left side. And the key is noticing the hips. So if you can be careful that you're not letting the hips rise. If you have sciatica, this would be a little difficult, so be conscious of that. Just hold that extension, that stretch. Three, two, one. Slowly sliding back into the center position. Bringing the hand back to the shoulder level, turn the palm over and then slowly come down. Beautiful, excellent. So noticing that these practices are not just working at the physical level, they started working on more and more on the mind level. So we're gonna move now to a little bit of balance. Um, this is again, I'm gonna request the modification to be done by Vijaya. Uh, why I've taken more some sitting balancing because we do not know what kind of audience we were getting. So we've taken a balance in sitting and a balance in standing. So the balance in the uh, sitting, we will be on our knees. So please cushion your knees. Uh, Vijaya, please uh, cushion your knees. Otherwise, if you uh, have no knee issues, you may come and balance your body on all fours. So we're gonna come up on all fours. Okay, we are going to be balancing on three and then two limbs. So the first practice is three pada. So first, just let's first get into a quadruped. So our knees are under the hips and the palms are under the shoulders. I want you to root down, spread your fingers, utilize balance. You're going to be aware that we're going to utilize balance. Okay. All right. From here, I want you to very slowly slide your right leg straight down at the back. Wait a minute. Okay, now breathe in, you're lifting your leg and your head to look ahead. So you're exactly in one line. Now be aware that your right palm is on, you're gonna be on the earth and you're lifting your left. So then slowly in this balance, you're lifting your left hand ahead. And you're waiting then stability for two or three breaths, five to 10 seconds, whatever works for you right now. Come down with your hand first, and then down with your leg. So let's bring that knee back. So one thing before we go to the other side, when we're on Tripa, the Madhurasan, just be aware that you're gonna keep the foot like you're putting a footprint on the back wall or the window, or whatever's behind you. So you're extending from the heel and the toe, you're keeping that flat. Let's keep that awareness as we move to slide the left leg straight down. Inhale, we're lifting the leg like a footprint on the back wall, lifting our head into a straight position. Now from here, stabilizing with your three limbs, then you're gonna lift the second arm. So you're lifting the right arm and we're holding. And there's a reason why balancing practices are very, very important for the mind. Slowly, very gently come back and then come back with your knee and take a moment and rest. So we're gonna sit here shortly, very shortly in Vajrasana. Vajrasan is the practice um, of the thunderbolt. This also brings calmness in the mind. Balancing practices are very important because they engage the mind with the right now. All other matters become silent. So you're dealing with what is happening this moment, being in the present. From here, we're gonna slide the hands down and come to a very restful pose, the child's pose. So I want you to very uh, carefully, yes, uh, Vijaya is gonna do the modification. Many a times, many individuals can't bring that forehead down to the earth. The objective is to now get the forehead touch something to quieten the mind. So let's take the hands in front and you're gonna slide the hands, maybe walk them or crawl them or slide them ahead and allow the body to lengthen here, the lower back lengthens. And from there, I'm gonna allow my forehead to meet with mother earth. There could be a tiny distance between your knees, if you wish. If the lower tummy is not letting you permit you to go down, that's fine. And then wrap your arms around your legs. And allow the forehead to be rested. This is one of the most beautiful practices to work on the mental mind. 
it quietens the thinking mind. The minute you touch your forehead to the earth or a base or a support, the thinking mind takes a moment of pause. This practice reminds us that we are rooted, we are supported, we are always the child. We forget that we have something more superior that looks after or takes care for us. This is one practice that reminds us that during the busy day, we need to learn to rest. We're going to take a deep inhale here. And as we exhale, we're going to slowly bring the arms back in front. One by one, no haste, no jerks. Be conscious, control movements. Allow movements to be with your say so. Know what's happening. And then slowly come up. And from here, we're going to move into the powerful practice of downward dog at the Mukshwanasana. So now you're spreading your fingers nice and wide. You're still supporting us as if you're on the towel. And you're going to raise your hips, tuck your toes in, raise your hips towards the ceiling. Into this mountain, this is also known as mountain pose, because you're in a V. And this is very powerful practice for the mental mind. Why? For mental disorders, because your brain is lower than your heart. Flow of energy, flow of prana, flow of blood is moving in this region. It actually brings wonderful blood circulation in the entire body. It is an energizing practice. So just be with your breath for another couple of breaths, maybe one or two. And also you will observe that there is a stretch at the legs, that is your hamstring getting pulled, but do not worry if you can't get the heels down. The objective right now is your mind. Be okay with whatever is happening within you. Accept. And then now very slowly, we're going to walk our way to the palms. So one step at a time. We're bringing the hands to the feet. And I'm going to request you to interlace your elbows and let your head hang. This is another wonderful practice. Again, an inversion. Why? The head is lower than the heart. But if you have acute back problems, you will avoid this practice. But if you have mild, this is also going to help you lengthen up in your lumbar region. Now from here, we're going to slowly lower the hands down. And we're going to unwind ourselves like a U-pin and come into a stand. Oh, wonderful. So I hope you all are joining us with these practices. Um, I want you to know that when we're doing these practices, not only are you watching your breath, but you're also understanding what is happening, the sense, what you're feeling, or what is happening when you're doing the practices. We are now uh, going to do a very beautiful practice. There's another uh, standing practice. We're going to do the parallel practice of Brikshasan. And why, as I said earlier, why did I want to do balancing practices? Balancing practices need a lot of attention, a lot of focus, a lot of concentration. The key to uh, balancing practices, uh, one of the principal keys is to focus on one stable point. And if we can inculcate, we can uh, bring this uh, um, balance in our dishti, in our focus, we can bring it into the body. But then this any practice, if there is some movements, don't uh, resist them, understand them, and learn from them. We are going to become the tree. And just like a tree, uh, the tree is not a pole. It does sway mildly in the, in the breeze. So be okay with the slight movements. And also be okay with the fact that you're going to inculcate the tree in your nature. So just like the tree changes, uh, the seasons change, the tree uh, leaves fall, but still the roots stay strong. So let's bring that nature into our practice and our being. So once again, I'm going to request you to all stand up. Okay. Vijaya is going to do the modification. So those individuals, um, if they have uh, any uh, knee issues or uh, balancing issues or whatever, I want you to please use, uh, for the beginning, very beginning, use a wall or use a chair or support. So we're going to keep our legs comfortably close, about an inch or two away from each other. 
and we're going to now keep our attention on a fixed point. So find a point at your horizon that you can look at. Now keep the weight on your right leg and you're going to fold your left leg. Your heel is going to reach the, peren uh, to the perineum. And then we're going to take your hands from the side and take it all the way up. We can go for the Kali Mudra. We're waiting here two to three breaths. Lengthening up. We're going to release the hands. And then release the leg. So this is just one half of the practice because we're balancing on both. Because the right hemisphere is uh, looking after the left side of the body and vice versa. So we need to work on both parts of the brain. So again, finding that twisty, taking the left leg up. Taking the leg into the perineum, take the arm, by the side. Hold. Two, three breaths. And down with the hand. And releasing the leg. So you can do this over a period of time, build from five seconds to 10, 10 to 15. And slowly, slowly, if you're a student, if you're you're most of young people. So try to see if you can bring it into a minute and see how that control works on your day-to-day -day life, your day-to-day -day living. Here now, I'm going to request uh, uh, Jeff to move into the center as I move to the side for some lying down practices. So before I carry on, I just would like to know that I, that, uh, I hope you all are getting to do these practices with us. Um, just a little feedback. How are you uh, feeling? I mean, if you're practicing with us, anybody who's joining us would like to share with us how are your, what is the state of your mind? Body is there. What is the state of your mind if you've been practicing with us? Feeling good, feeling relaxing, amazing. Feeling peaceful. Peaceful, very good. Controlled, that's a wonderful word. That's it. That's, that's the key, you know, conditioning, control, changing, environment, wonderful. Thank you. So now we're going to just bring in some cooling down practices. As much as we like to do um, uh, dynamic practices, we also have to understand relaxing, wonderful. So we are going to do first just one more practice, which is an inversion where the brain is lower than the heart, and then a cooling down practice. So which are kindly from, turn from one side and lie on your back. I think actually you are not in the screen, so I'll have to compromise. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So if you can see Vijay a little better now in the screen, so we'll go ahead. All right. So turning one from the one side again, I request Vijay. We're going to move into the practice of Setu Bandhasan. These are simple inversions. We can go for the higher version. Uh, but uh, keeping in mind that we do not know what kind of audience we're going to be uh, having with us today. So these are simpler inversions that we can connect to at the very beginning and then move ahead to more uh, advanced practices. So now slowly bring your two legs together, hands by the body side into the starting position. Slowly bend your legs one at one time. Don't worry about bringing it in uh, together for now. The objective is control conscious movements. Now, keeping your hands by the side, keep a distance between your knees and your feet. Okay. Now, take your attention to your breathing. We're going to become the bridge. We're going to be strong with our, our body. We're going to engage the core muscles. This is strengthening both the uh, top and lower posterior spine, uh, posterior body. So, inhale. And as you exhale, slowly start to lift your hips, lumbar spine. Thoraxal spine. Keep your hands firm on the earth and feel the weight on your shoulders and your feet, your entire feet, the heels. Noticing that you're using the exhalation to maybe take a slight lift if possible and closing your eyes, just watch the breath. Allow the flow of blood, allow the pranic energy to move up. Flooding the heart. This is also a heart opener. Why are we talking about uh, this right now? We'll talk about it later. Uh, this is a, this is opens up the heart because this is the seat of your emotion. Slowly, we're going to gently come down, vertebrae by vertebrae, in reverse, in reverse. Excellent. Now we're going to let those knees be bent, 
and we're going to go for a twist. Twisting practices are very, very lovely because they release all the uh, stresses or the blockages. They detoxify each cell level. So not only the physical, but also the mental level. So you're going to slide your hands at the level of your shoulder. So just have a look, look at each arm to see it's at the level of the shoulder. If you have lack of space, you can even place your hands under the head. So whichever is your uh, availability right now, you will be doing with that. Knees touch together, feet touch together. There are 22 variations of Kati, uh, Gakkara's practices, twisting practices. We're just connecting to one of them. So we're going to be aware of the breath, breathe in. And as we exhale, take both the knees towards the right. Make sure the knees are on top, the feet are on top, and take your head in the opposite direction. If you have cervical issue, just go gently with your neck. Don't overdo. And just be here with a conscious awareness of each breath. I want that abdomen to rise and fall with each breath. Lovely. Slowly come back with your head in the center and then slowly bring the knees back to the center and take the twist on the other side. So both the knees move to the left, head to the right. And this is a very calming practice. If you've been practicing uh, yoga practices before, you will notice that how cooling, calming, relaxing, rejuvenating this practice can be. So do connect with your practices on a routine and detoxifying, energizing your being. Coming back with your head in the center first and then your two knees back to the center. And from here, we're going to very slowly, gently first release the arms a little close to the body, but not adjacent to it, a little distance, because we are connecting to the practice of Shavasana. Shavasana is one of the major practices for releasing mental stress. As I said, before you go for anything, if you relax the body, the mind automatically rests. So we're going to slide our right leg down, little extension of the heel, and keep it a little open, slide the other leg down. Keep a little distance between your feet, six inches or eight, depending on your height, and your arms a little away from the body. And with your eyes closed, I want you to allow the body to sink into the mat. I want you to allow yourself to become the element of water. Allow yourself to spill down to the floor. And as you do that, I want you to now just take your attention and just scan your body from the top of your head down to the toes and from the toes up to the head. And as you all lie here in your Shavasana, with your mind's eye, you're going to relax each and every part. Auto-suggestion, you're going to tell that part, you're going to visualize it and relax it. So with your mind's eye, visualize your feet. Keep them loose and relax them. Relax the ankle joints. Your knees. Your hips. Take your attention to your spine, relax the entire spine, all 33 vertebrates from the tailbone up to your shoulder and neck collar. Relax and soften your stomach. Relax your chest, allow breathing to continue normally, naturally, in a very comfortable way. Relax your arms, even your fingers and fingertips. Take your attention to your throat. Swallow and swallow if you need and then relax the tongue and the throat. Relax the entire face, each and every feature of your face. 
Relax the top of your head and the back of your head. Just allow yourself to be at the physical level like a still body. And now take your attention with the breath. Exist like the breath. Allow this calming, cooling breath to calm and cool and quieten the mind. Just be here for a few moments until I call you back. As you allow yourself to be in this comfortable manner, you may now start to be aware of your fingers. Be aware of your toes. And tiny movements into the fingers and toes. Slowly slide your two legs together. Bring your hands by the body side, palms down, downwards. We're just going to give yourself a little stretch to reconnect with the physical body. Again, stretch your two legs ahead and slowly without bending the elbows, take your arms overhead to the back into this beautiful practice of Uttana Tarasan, a full body stretch, a tug of war that's taking place, lower body, upper body. Now, as you inhale, slowly bring your body arms back, relax the legs. And I'm going to allow you to keep those eyes closed. Do not disturb the mind too much. Gently bend your knees and turn your body to the right side. Lie on your right side. Cushioning your head with your arm. And using your left hand, you're going to push off the floor gently and come into seat. Try not to open your eyes if you can. Otherwise, even if you have opened your eyes, just see if you can allow them to have half a gaze. So just let them be lower. So that was a very, very important practice for mental health. We keep thinking that... Um, we are doing yoga that one hour or 45 minutes on the mat. But the reality is that that 45 minutes, half an hour, 15 minutes that you're doing on the mat is a reflection of what has happened during the day. So the way you are on the mat gives you an idea. It gives you a feedback what's happened in the day. It's an aina, like your beautiful title. It's an aina. It's a reflection of what is happening in your day. So if we can bring a little control in the mind, in the body, during the day, it will reflect and vice versa. We can get this feedback and use this negative feedback method to correct ourselves in our daily activity, daily lives. So it's a wonderful feedback mechanism that uh, is really works for us. The next practice we're going to be uh, connecting to is this uh, component that we talked about. That is a component of, component of pranayam. So uh, we talked about how we are connecting to uh, expansion of the lungs. We, told, we spoke a little about um, uh, what is happening uh, to the mind, how it works. So just bring a little science, a little token of science. Uh, in our daily life, the way we are breathing, uh, we are generally breathing over here. So now just for a second, just for a second, just to get an idea, I want you to keep your hands on your thighs, okay? And just take a deep breath. Or just breathe, just breathe. And notice what part of your body is actually moving. Okay, do you feel that your shoulders are moving, chest was moving? Or do you feel the abdomen was moving? Whatever your answer is, with yourself, keep that with yourself. Because now we're going to see what it should have been. If your shoulders and your neck started moving, that means you are breathing over here in your top part of your lungs, uh, which is your, uh, your shoulder, your clavicle region. If you were moving slightly here, there was a little movement here, that means you may be breathing from your chest, thorax or breathing. But ideally, we should be always trying to breathe abdominally. So what is it, uh, how does that work? So basically, um, 
what happens is that uh, our body is divided by a very important muscle called the diaphragm, which is the very most important muscle in our breathing apparatus. So when it's at rest, when it's actually at rest, it is in this concave way, like a C shape. So this muscle fiber exists in a C shape within our body. So when we take a breath in, that muscle fiber contracts and becomes flat. When it becomes flat, the chest region expands, it becomes bigger. So we are able to breathe deeper in all the three parts of our lungs, the top, the middle, and the lower part of our lungs. And when we exhale, it relaxes, and again, it becomes a C-shape, and the air empties out. So with that knowledge, we are going to take a few deep breaths. And while this is happening, what is happening in the tummy? So if you notice what I say about abdominal breathing, diaphragmatical breathing, or belly breathing. So while this is happening, when we are breathing in, what is happening as the diaphragm pushes down, the stomach wall gets pushed, our tummy starts to come out. But we're not, we're not breathing in the tummy, basically. The tummy muscles are just uh, getting, uh, the, uh, the abdominal wall is getting pushed down. So the organs are slightly coming out. And when we're breathing out, the diaphragm again relaxes and the abdominal muscles, uh, the abdomen uh, wall goes in and the, uh, the organs get back in. So we are going to do abdominal breathing for a simple plain way. I'm going to describe it. Imagine now you're going to be breathing into a balloon. So the way you're going to breathe in, full expansion and full contraction. So please place your right hand on your navel. Notice the tummy. And your left hand near to your chest. All right, so we're going to do abdominal breathing. So you're going to breathe, keep your body nice and strong, keep your shoulders relaxed, face soft. Breathe in through your nose and fill up your entire chest and feel the abdominal wall come out like belly breathing. And as you exhale, allow the chest to empty out and draw the abdomen in, let the abdomen sink, deflate. And at the very far end of your exhalation, maybe you can draw the navel inwards a little more. By doing three breaths, breathe in again. Fill up the chest, fill up the abdomen. Exhale. Notice the diaphragm is relaxing, abdomen is going inwards. Chest is emptying out. Last breath, inhale. And let's see. And relax. Allow your eyelids to be closed. Keep your hands on your knees and rest it. If you were doing this practice with us, you would automatically know that somehow, some way, the body has become calm. It has become quiet. And knowing this practice is very powerful for us to allow ourselves to be in control in tight situations, stressful situations, during exam times, just, uh, during some conflicts, whatever. They really are powerful practice. We're going to connect to the practice of a pranayam, allowing the eyelids to open. Just a little briefing on the pranayam that we're going to be doing. Today, we've just spoken one, we've chosen one particular pranayam which works on all the different types of mental disorders, especially with stress, anxiety, and depression. And this pranayam is known as Brahmari Pranayam. All these pranayams are very powerful. They all, think, they all do work. But this particular pranayam works on all the type of mental disorders. Why? Because it creates a soothing sound and uh, it uh, allows us to engage with that sound to allow us to move into a deeper state of uh, awareness and meditation. Uh, the sound, just as a small note on the technique, this sound that we are going to be hearing is a sound of the bumblebee. Okay, so this sound is a sound that is a nasal sound, not a humming sound. And when we're doing this primary pranayam, what are we focusing on, on the exhalation? So the exhalation should be slightly longer. It's also known as uh, uh, Brahmari Rechak, the exhalation. A little token, when we're doing this practice, uh, when we do the nasal sound, to enhance that nasal sound, if we place the tongue on the top part of our teeth, uh, at the top palate, 
don't press it, just touch it over there. The nasal sound will be created a little more advanced, more in an enhanced way. So we're going to be basically sitting with our hands on our knees in chin mudra, keeping a lovely long spine. And we're working on creating that navel sound and we're listening to that sound because that sound, it brings tranquility, calmness and leads us into meditation. And that's what we're going to do. So if you're comfortable, all of us, we're going to stay here for a little longer as we move from Brahmari to Dhyana. So let's begin. Close your eyes. Complete awareness within. Breathe in. Make this your last round. Allow yourself just to experience the resonance of this beautiful vibration. Observe what's happening to the state of your mind after this good, beautiful primary pranayam. Continuing to sit in this position, we're just going to take a short moment of awareness of how we are seated, allowing the eyelids to remain closed. We're just going to take our attention to the top part of our body. Just try to find a little more length in your spine. Allow yourself to rise just a little. And from your seat bone, seat bone be grounded to the earth. And here, just allow the shoulders to be relaxed. Allow the face to be soft, tender. And allow this relaxation of the body to keep you in state of comfort. As now we take our complete attention to the breathing, to the breath. Notice the fact that you are breathing. Notice the breath itself. Allow each breath to fill up this abdomen, fill up this body with prana, with energy. Now, as the exhalation to relax and detoxify the mind and the body. Just notice where the breath is taking place more. Is it happening more at the abdomen? Or is it happening more in the chest? Or do you sense it more at the nostrils? Just check in and acknowledge wherever that you experience this breath.
Notice the speed of your breath. Is it fast or slow? Is it deep or shallow? However it is, without judgment, without modification, continue just to watch the breath, witness the breath. Don't do, just see, just be. We are human beings, we've forgotten how to be. Just witness this breath. And if your mind has jumped onto a thought, and that will happen. Without judgment, without disturbing, just bring it back to the breath. Allow it to come back to the breath. Whenever it flickers, take your attention back to where you felt the breath more. Now for the last few breaths with awareness, allow each breath to be energy, positivity, strength, acceptance. And allow each exhalation a way to let go the act of surrender, of release, of being okay, throwing out negativity, and calm. We can take a resolve and to resolve to ourselves that we are strong, we are flexible, we are accepting and capable in anything and everything. And with this resolve, we will gently bring our attention back to this body, back to the way we are sitting, back to this room that we are in, and back to our friend, the breath, as we come to complete today's session with one Om chant. So join us. Breathe in. Stay there. Grab your palms together. And gently place them over the eyes and the face. Namaste, everyone. I hope you could join us through this journey of our experiential yoga practice. Because yoga is for wellness, it is for health and healing. So I would like to uh, take this moment and uh, come a little ahead and thank our host, uh, Jigisha. Thank you very much for giving us this platform to share this knowledge, this discipline with your members and others who have joined us. Uh, it was really an honor to be here. So we could take a few questions, uh, uh, whoever would like or your rotary, your rotary club would like. So please feel free to share any doubts. So how the experience was also, if that would be wonderful. Sure, I'd request everyone to send in their questions, comments, everything in the chat box so we can read it out loud. I'll just come a little closer. I think I'll have to make the camera come up. Yeah, no, I'll just take it up. Can I hear it? Yes. 
I'm actually going to take off the earpiece now. So, So, um, thank you so much for the lovely comments. Um, can you hear me? Can you all hear us? Yes, we can. Okay, great. Because I just took off the EOP. We have a few questions in the chat box. Okay, can you read them out? Because I think I yeah. skipped a few. In the so Adil yes. says, my question revolves around addiction, which is constantly spoken about in the media. Yes. Uh, addiction. How does that work? Okay. So um, youths today, I will, this is a question that's actually been asked by a few members uh, of our own uh, community. So youths today are subjected to addiction. It doesn't always have to be a very negative thing or very taboo thing. It could be simple things like... Uh, um, even drinking coffee or, you know, addicted to some kind of uh, routine. So basically, yoga is a holistic practice. It's a holistic science. It's actually a science of prevention in nature. So if we connect to yoga practices and the different components of yoga practices, they allow us to empower ourselves to reduce this. Um, so let's understand yoga, uh, the, the term yoga, was beautifully, not the term, but the, one of the sutras of yoga is Yoga Chitra Vitri Niroda. Uh, this is the second sutra uh, from Sage Patanjali uh, that describes how we can control the functioning of the mind or the fluctuations of the mind. So if we can bring a little control over the functioning or the patterns of the mind, we can bring ourselves to overcome this addiction. So these conditionings are caused by what? By our desires or, uh, or uh, likes or dislikes. So over a time, these conditionings become so permanent that we want it. We really want it. We, we don't know our mind, the intellect says, um, whatever it is, I want it. So what we have to do first is slowly start to get away from this conditioning. And uh, that can be done by uh, building our obey power. So first to recognize what that conditioning is and then get willpower to change it. So a very simple example, okay? This is for me also when I was, uh, when I had uh, come in from uh, my uh, earlier lift. So I had a, a liking for coffee and I would have coffee very often, okay? So I knew coffee multiple times if I have coffee through the day in a different climate, it's not going to be good for me. So I started telling myself that it's not good for me. I'm going to start at least reducing it stepwise, baby steps, reducing it at least once or twice a day. So this conditioning started becoming weaker and weaker and my willpower became stronger and stronger. So it could be any conditioning. So if you allow yourself to take baby steps and start weakening that conditioning, those old likes and dislikes, which cause negative effects, you can start moving towards a positive effect. And that willpower that you have been you'll be getting over a period of time will empower you to change those addictions so nowadays we hear about cigarettes we talk about alcohol it could be any type of conditioning so the first step is to acknowledge it to recognize it whatever the condition uh, whatever that negative uh, emotion and negative uh, uh, problem that you're having recognize it slowly start taking baby steps towards it gain that with uh, willpower and change it and this all, can ha this all happens when you start doing yoga practices because in your yoga practices, you're empowering yourself. You're connecting to how to condition. If you don't do all the, you know, the static practices are working on your neuromuscular. So you're controlling even the movement. Sometimes, you know, when you're sitting to meditate, you'll find an itch or you'll find a disturbance. You'll feel like moving your, you know, suddenly you just, you hear a sound and you want to open your eyes. Take a second. No, I don't have to open my eyes. It's not calling out for me. Change that. Change that reactive state to bring in that conditioning and that conditioning can be used for your um, any type of addiction that we have. So acknowledge it and then start to change it with baby steps. So this is one of the ways, one of the approaches of yoga that really works with addiction. So I hope that could answer the question to a basic level. Definitely. 
We have one question. How long does it take to get the postures right? So this is, this is one of the problem, uh, not the problem, one of the uh, words that we keep hearing. Yoga is a practice. Yoga is not perfect. So like even medicine is a practice. So perfection is in your own eyes. It's not in what it is uh, for others. So you should slowly start building, noticing the changes that happen within you. So don't worry about getting that uh, traditional practice of what you see in the media, or what, what maybe our yogis do. That you will, you know, that will happen over a period of time. So it's practice. The more you practice, the more you can build, the more you can connect. And you'll realize that you are okay with whatever you are. That's what, again, what the yoga does. You accept and you connect to that and you actually evolve from that. So um, even as I said, you know, I requested Vijay to join me for today's practice because I said, you know, many individuals would have knee issues and how would they be able to cope and again to talk. So I requested her to share with me this practice. So there's no perfection. There's no competition in yoga. It's your own interpretation and your understanding and your own growth. So this yoga is not a perfection. It's a practice. So please keep practicing. Abhyas. The one more related to this, it says, how much time should we spend per day on the yoga practices and what is the best time to do it? Okay. So, as I said, yoga that you're doing on the mat is your reflection of the day, the 23 hours. Okay. So, uh, maybe it could be five minutes at the beginning. Don't worry about the time. The fact that you took time to, uh, to give yourself to reflect what you did, to get a feedback of how the day was. So you could start with five minutes, 10 minutes, slowly start building. So if you make it a routine about 45 minutes to an hour in, over a period of time, don't rush into it. It'll be a wonderful time for you to reflect how you are the last 23 hours or 23 and a half hours. And the best time, um, well, basically um, yoga, uh, we say, can be done at any hour on a light stomach. But generally, if you've noticed in the morning, your body cortisol levels automatically are slightly higher. Your body in the morning time is slightly higher. And again, we have another peak in the evening. So morning, evening times are a good time. And what you will notice the difference between the morning and the evening, the morning might be slightly more stiffer, just a little more, uh, uh, more difficult to get into the posture, but that's okay because you slept for the last eight hours or six to eight hours. So the circulation is reduced. And in the evening, you will notice that you are more flexible. But whatever time, what hour that you choose, dedicate it to it and keep it on the same time every day. And that's how the abhyasa or the practices become more uh, positive and evolve within you. But uh, even if you don't get those two slots, any time on a light stomach would be good enough. Okay, we have one last question. Um, Maitri is asking you, what is your opinion of Dhamma? Dharma. I think she means Dhamma. Metri, would you like to clarify? Hello. Yeah. Um, I'm really sorry. I can't uh, switch my cam on right now, but I hope that doesn't interrupt the connection. Yeah, uh, I'm talking about Dhamma. Uh, it's, it's a form of, uh, uh, you know, way of living kind of, I would say, that uh, people follow in Buddhism. Okay. Yeah. So uh, we actually, that is Buddhism. This is uh, traditional Indian culture. So I would not be able to speak a lot about what Buddhism follows because this is more on the Indian culture. So basically, there are many paths. You know, yoga has many paths. So we, there is karma yoga, which is the yoga of action. There's bhakti yoga, the yoga of uh, devotion. So I cannot talk about Buddhism as such, but generally, whichever path that you choose, if it be Buddhist, or follow it as per your acceptance. Every, whichever path that you choose, whichever path that appeals to you, connects to you, follow that and let it uh, help you grow. So I will not be able to say about Dharma, but whatever path, you, so whichever path that you choose, the destination is the same. So keeping that in mind, uh, if you are interested in the Buddhist uh, term or the Buddhist, uh, Buddhist uh, way of connecting, uh, you would 
like to connect to that, it's, that's fine. But the destination, okay. as you always remember, destination is the same. It is your universe, uh, your uh, consciousness to meet with the universal consciousness. Because okay. yoga is not only physical, it's actually a spiritual practice in each. Right. No, but uh, the reason I ask this is because, uh, you know, the way yoga has to do a lot with us, like, you know, it doesn't have to much do with others or anything else. The same way uh, this path, you know, explains is how we stay with ourselves and in the present moment, which is very much similar to yoga okay. in a way. Okay, so like we also read today, uh, what we talked about, what, what we're using classical yoga, we're connecting to Ashtang yoga. So we are connected to the, all the components that lie within us because we say that yoga is not a work out, instead it's a work in. So with, with your beautiful uh, explanation of what was uh, the Buddhist terms, remembering that Ashtang yoga is also the same thing. We are working inwards. We are moving out from the outside, working inwards because there's a universe that lies within and we don't even connect to it. So in sometimes when, you sit, when we start our practices, if you notice, we started with a, a few minutes, a minute of connecting with ourselves before we got into the practices. Because without that connection, we would have stayed still connected to the outside to a, to a certain extent. So I hope uh, that could uh, kind of answer your uh, query or the question that you were referring Thank you to. so much. Thank you. Thank you. So it was uh, really wonderful. Okay. Any more questions that you would like to? There aren't okay. any other questions in the chat box. If anyone has any questions, you all can just unmute yourself and ask. Hello, Nena? Yes, hello. Yeah, this is uh, Jayashree, your Masi. Oh. Hi, Masi. How are you? Nice of you to join I'm us. Fine. Yeah. Okay. Uh, initially, when you started, it was written about Soham, that I yes. think it's the breathing, no? And yes. what does, uh, does Soham helps and what is it exactly, in what way is it beneficial? Okay. So if you noticed, uh, we talked about meditation when we talked about Soham. So what happens, we have two type of, uh, not, we have multiple type of meditation. Meditations, but uh, I'm talking about this meditation of uh, transcendental because you're connecting to your breathing. So we say when we are breathing in, sometimes we lose track. Are we breathing in, breathing out? Are we connecting to the breath or not? So we create this, uh, we in our mind, when we are breathing in, we say so, and when we're breathing out, we're saying hum. So you're connecting to a sound, a mono sound usually. It could be almost, this is a dual sound. So when we are Connecting to that breathing in and breathing out with a so hum, so hum. Automatically, your thoughts transcend beyond. Today, what we did actually was mindful meditation. We kept our mind with the breath. We kept it bringing it back to the breath. You know, bringing it back. I said, if your mind jumps, if it flickers, bring it back to the breath. But so hum meditation or transcendental meditation, it allows you to first connect with something. And then you will automatically, your thoughts will transcend and you will be in a state of freedom. Uh, this kind of uh, transcendental type of uh, meditation uh, is a very powerful meditation and you might be knowing two celebrities or multiple celebrities which, but uh, two are that I recall are uh, Opera Winfrey and Hugh Jackman. They connect to this kind of meditation and they found a huge change in their lives. So uh, whichever type of meditation, whichever type of uh, inner connection that you feel that you are uh, getting pulled towards, connect to it. There is no right or wrong. There's, you know, it, every individual is unique. So everyone's path will be slightly different. We, these options are open for you to see what connects with you. So, uh, Soham, uh, it's a wonderful, uh, wonderful way to move into meditation. So that's one of the examples I wished to share with you all. So I hope, uh, um, and you all continue with your practices and to connect with meditation also. So, there's any, thank you for joining us, Marcy. Just a little note. It's lovely to have you here. Yeah, all I can see in the chat. Thank you so much for the wonderful session. We really enjoyed it, loved it, insightful, relaxing. I'm just seeing all of this. So, I'm so glad. 
Thank you, ma'am, for gracing us with your presence today out of your busy schedule. Thank you to everyone. Thank you to I have uh, uh, Adil was my son's friend and uh, um, he suggested it and he encouraged me. So I'm thankful to him and all of you wonderful individuals to uh, to share this knowledge and spread it. And uh, remember one key thing: just today is not a celebration of mental health. Not even 10th of October. Mental health day should be addressed every day. So if you can connect to yourself, try to work what works in within you. If if you're going through something, don't hide it, don't suppress it, share it. And if you can offer that to others, please do, because um, as we said, we are working uh, we are working within, but we are also social creatures. So we need to connect to others also and share this and to let humanity find peace. And that's the key, peace. So from here, I would love to like the bridge to everything. And the breath is the bridge to everything. <laughs> and that is our aina. So your mat is your aina, your breath is your aina. So you always that's remember. True. That. That's so true. Thank you so much, ma'am. It was a pleasure having you. On another side note, I'd also like to thank the Rotary Club of UGC, Rotary Club of Khalsa College, and Rotary Club of Bombay Pier for supporting us and making this event so successful. And once again, thank you so much, ma'am. We really appreciate having you here. Thank you so much for joining us. And thank you, Vijaya, for um, uh, giving us your time. And everyone, thank you, everyone. Uh, all the participants, uh, I thank you all and uh, have a lovely day. And please continue your practice always. And remember, baby steps. Don't have to jump high. Okay. Take care. Yes, Thank ma'am. You. Thank you Bye. so much. Hope to see you soon. Same here. Take care. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye. Bye-bye.